I'm Jessitron, and I'm here to talk about concurrency options on the JVM, or everything you never wanted to know about Java Executor Service, but really needed to. Back when I used to drive fast, I used to think it would be super awesome to have the road system all to myself, and I could go as fast as I wanted, and I could take the turns really tight, and I'd never have to worry about any other cars or traffic laws or stoplights. It's kind of like programming in a single thread. You can really get moving. But in the end, just as a road system is wasted on just a single car, often in our programs, we want to do two things at once. And when we do that, we use threads. So on the, on the JVM, a thread is a thing. It has two stacks. It takes up a meg of memory by default and one program counter. And it's also a native resource. Um, so kind of like file descriptors, you probably won't run out of them. But when you do, it, it really sucks. So we have to like appreciate these things. Uh, what we get for that is an extra flow of execution, which is super useful in a couple ways. You can use it to separate concerns and make your code prettier. But more often, we use it so that while one flow of execution is waiting on I.O., on a disk read or a network call, something else can keep going. Or sometimes, we want to use all our processors because we're really doing that much computing. Careful with that. It's a lot easier to slow yourself down with multi-threading than to really speed it up. But sometimes that's totally necessary and we want to do that. OK, but when we need another person delivering pizza while we're dropping our kid off at school, we don't go to the car dealer and buy a car. We use a car service, like our taxi service. Um, maybe we use Uber. And Java provides those abstractions for us. As part of that, as part of concurrency with threads. We're all adults here, and we know that once there's two cars on the road, everything gets more complicated. We need lane markers. We need traffic signals. We need all this stuff. And I, I mean, I'm just assuming that we all know not to share mutable state without a really strong abstraction framework that's helping us with that. There's books and books about mutable state, and this talk is not one of them, about how to share state between, between threads. Instead, I think we tend to focus on that, and we lose track of some of the other questions that we need to ask as soon as we have more than one thread running in our program. Like, how many cars do we want on the road? We don't want it to get too crowded, especially when, on my laptop, only eight of them can be moving at a time. And uh, once we have all these cars driving around, how do we know when we're done with all our, our work? And uh, how do we handle it when a car crashes? All of these things are things we have to think about. In this talk, I want to ask those questions. And then I've got five concurrency abstractions that I've picked from the Java Scala closure ecosystems. And I'm, I mean, I'm not going to be able to tell you which one of these to use, because you should use the one that fits the shape of your problem. But I want to use these to illustrate the different trade-offs that we're making and the different decisions that go into uh, our program, whether we're making them consciously or not, whenever we do concurrency on the JVM. All of these are built around executor service. So if threads are down here, they're like, oh, it's so simple on the JVM threads. They're, yeah, they're very simple. And please don't use them directly. And then we've got these high-level frameworks up here like Akka and Core Async. And solidly in between them is the Java Executor Service. All of these questions and trade-offs that I'm saying we should worry about are in your choice of Java Executor Service. So that's where I'm focusing today. And we'll see which executor services these different abstractions let you use or force you to use and how you might choose a good executor service and make the right trade-offs for your program. Because every abstraction, the best it can do is cut away the cruft and make it easy to do things right. You still have to know what you're doing. So this is 30 minutes of now you know a little more of what you're doing. All right, what is the executor service? To get down in the weeds of Java, uh, the executor service is an interface around a thread pool of some sort. 
and it's a super interface of executor. So executor is the super simple interface. All you can do is give it a job to run. With the executor service, which extends executor, then you can also manage the thread pool with things like shutdown and more that we'll see. Typically, you'll use the thread pool executor implementation of these, but you won't construct it directly. Who does that anymore? You'll probably use the executors class, which is a convenience class full of static methods that construct thread pool executor, which implement executor service, which you will use for your concurrency or give to your framework that you're using, your abstraction. Executor service is a fantastic example of object-oriented composition at its best because it takes a thread pool and a blocking queue and puts them in together into something greater than either of them separately. It turns out that this is way useful. Because threads are a limited resource, we don't spin them up directly. There's too much overhead in starting them up and stopping them down. So of course we want to pool them, but as soon as you're pooling resources, you've got a lot of work to do, and the executor service does that work, and it does it pretty well. The simplest possible one would be the single thread executor. You get one of those with the executors class. Now you have one other car to get the pizza while you take your kids to school. So you tell it to get the pizza. It gets the pizza, you take your kids to school. Everyone's happy, your main thread exits, and your program just sits there. And it never exits. Why, why, can't it tell that I'm done? Well, no, it can't, because you have an extra flow of execution and it's still, well, it's not actually going anywhere, but the JVM is like, it, it's still valid, I'm, I'm still up. So the first question we have to ask when we start using concurrency is what is done? A question that has plagued programmers forever and now it's plaguing our programs too. A couple ways, in our main thread, we could always system.exit, you can do that from everywhere and it's kind of cheating that will shut everything down. It's much more polite to keep your executor service and ask it to shut down. This has the benefit of letting it, as soon as you call this, it will reject any further tasks, but this will let it continue and finish everything that's in its queue, so the pizza will get delivered even if you've already dropped your kid off at school and your main thread is exited. Well, you don't exit, you call this first and then exit. And that way, uh, when the pizza is delivered, the executor service will shut down the idle thread and the JVM will exit, yay. But sometimes you don't want to keep track of your executor service. Your executor service is like in a library or something and you don't want to pass it up to the main to be shut down um, before exit. So within the executor service itself, you can tell it to shut down in a couple different ways. You could give it a keep alive time, which says if your thread is idle for one minute or whatever, then go ahead and shut it down. Eventually then all your threads will shut down and your program will exit just slower than it would have otherwise. Or you can say these are daemon threads. This says, look JVM, these threads, they're really, they're just not that important. Don't stay open just for these. It's very useful, something I, want to do pretty often if I'm creating thread pools, which I hope I don't do very often, except for this talk, I did it a lot. <laughs> so you would think that would be easy. To, to, to make a daemon thread, more Java weeds here, you need to set the daemon flag on the thread. Ew, a setter, gross. <laughs> to do that, you need to get a thread. And then you need to return it from a new thread method which goes inside a new thread factory, which you can finally pass to that constructor method. <laughs> yes, it is this ugly. Uh, so of course people have built little abstractions. There's like a, if, if you wanna do this yourself, you might consider using the thread pool builder in Akka. That's a nice implementation of an abstraction that makes this easier. But watch out while you're in there, you might encounter the executor service factory provider. <laughs> <laughs> It was hard not to run screaming, but really, the, the, it has a purpose. Three purposes, obviously. All right. <laughs> if you do this, then you need to know that these threads will just shut down. They won't finish their work. They won't finish what they're doing. They're just gone. The JVM kicks them out. If you want them to finish what they're doing, then after you call shutdown, you have to await termination. This says, wait, shutdown says stop accepting any future requests. This says uh, block until everything's done that was in the queue. And of course we give it a timeout because never ever block forever. That's the worst thing you can do in a system that you ever want to finish. Okay, 
So let's look at how each of these abstractions um, decides how it's done. And also, while I'm there, I'll give you like the 50,000 mile overview. This is what actors look like from the moon. All right, so actors are in Scala, the ACA framework. I've used this and it's really, it's pretty amazing, but it's not, it's not easy, but it's amazing. All right, actors basically are the epitome of OO. This is what object-oriented programming wanted to be because all they do is tell, don't ask. Each actor has its own little territory and within that it's free to mutate the state because the actor code will only ever run on a single thread. And then there's this thread pool of red cars running around the dispatch with red pool, delivering messages and performing whatever actions the actor has coded. And then they kind of honk at each other to send messages. And all of that is coordinated by the central actor system and its supervisor hierarchy so that you can treat actors as their own little execution flow, but they are sharing threads and everything and it's pretty efficient. Um, Right, so the nice thing about this is it's pretty obvious if you want the actor system to shut down, you have to tell it. So it's an explicit shutdown. And the last time I worked on an actor system, we seriously spent days and weeks working on when is it right to shut down and how long should we wait and how can we back up and then time out and then shut down now. And man, it's hard to know when you're done. I wish I was writing just web servers where when are you done? Never! <laughs> That's so much simpler. Right, so actors are, it's a pretty heavyweight system and you really need to, to learn about it in order to use it. Closure, built into the language, has agents, which take a common use case for actors and um, just simplify it down and give you just this one common use case. An agent, like an actor, has its own territory. It has some state that it manages. It's always giving out its state, the last known good value to whoever asks. But if you want to change that state, then you send it a message. And the agent maintains its own queue of messages, each of which can update the state inside of it. So the agent itself is going to run on a single thread, much like an actor. And then, for not so simple, there's actually two thread pools that do this in Clojure. If in your program you ever send a message to an agent, a send message is expected to be computation only and fast and not block and it runs on a thread pool that requires explicit shutdown. So if you ever do that, you have to call shutdown agents at the bottom of your main in your closure program or uh, your program won't exit. On the other hand, if you use send off to send a message to an agent, that is expected to block, possibly. It's, it's allowed to block inside. Um, so that's a different thread pool, and that one happens to have a one minute timeout. So if you never send and only send off, your program will exit, it'll just make you wait for a minute, whatever. Or you can call shutdown agents. Now the negative of calling shutdown agents is if your, actor, or if your agents have stuff in their queues that you actually wanted them to do, like maybe something side affecting network call, um, that won't happen unless you await the agent before calling shutdown. All right, so that's agents. Clojure has another uh, popular, or at least, it's at least popular conferences. <laughs> <laughs> Concurrency framework, which is core async. And that one uses channels. So conceptually, I think of it kind of like there's a rectangle in the road and a car comes in and it needs to either, either receive or send a message, either one, and it's gonna wait there until the other car shows up and then it's gonna pass the envelope through the window. Do that transaction? Uh, that's, that's a channel and it's, it's really a queue. It's a synchronous blocking queue, which means that you also have the option of putting um, a queue with some storage in your channel and then a car can drop off a message and another car can come to the other side and pick it up later. Conceptually, that's kind of how channels work. Thread pool wise, it uses daemon threads. So when your main exits, pff, your channels dissolve into the ether. So you get to decide in your main when it's done. For something much, much, much simpler, I mean by far the easiest way to use concurrency in Java or Scala, or a little bit in Clojure, is just to use parallel streams. And in here, we're trying to use all the CPUs. So if we've got one map reduce operation, we try to fork it off, use all the lanes on the highway, and then we've got four cars proceeding on a four CPU machine. Um, all at the same time, and then they come back together with the reduce. 
And this one uses daemon threads, which makes sense because really you're, you're waiting for your MapReduce to complete anyway. Finally, futures. Futures are available in all four languages, Java, Scala, Clojure, and Scala Z. And they're different in all of them. But conceptually, a future is it's not really much of an abstraction. It, it just, in, in Java 5, the idea was introduced that maybe when you start this flow of execution over there, you might want it to return a value. Future is like a box. Before I, before I send a job over to Uber, uh, I drop a box in the road, and then the Uber car comes and drops a return value in it when it's done. So hopefully you get something inside your future eventually. Unless you don't, you might get an exception instead. Lucky you. <laughs> now, we've since learned the, the only way to get something out of that uh, in a plain Java 5 future is to wait for it, to block. Your car has to come back and look in the box at some point, or you'll never see that lovely exception sitting there for you. The solution to that is that some futures, the good ones, allow you to attach instructions to the box that say, oh, and after that good thing gets here, or that bad thing, do this. And then you don't have to block in order for those instructions to be executed. In Java, uh, OK, some more weeds here. The executor, the super simple interface that's only give me jobs to do, the only method on that is execute, and it takes a runnable. Executor service adds the submit method, which takes a callable and returns a future. And you'd think, oh, clearly that's the one we want to use. <laughs> None of the abstractions actually use Java futures because you can't, you can't add the instructions. You can't map. You can't flat map. You can't extend them in any way. And you always have to block on them. So everybody just uses execute and does their own little careful mutable state manage, management to get coordination between threads. In Java 8, you can actually do this. It's called computable, no, completable future. Naming is hard. But this you can attach instructions to. Uh, to get one, you do supply async and you give it a supplier function and an executor. So the nice thing about futures, uh, nice, is you get to pick where it's going to run. That is up to you. So you can make your own thread pool, and then you get to think about all these questions. In Java, you can, this will default. The executor has a default of the common pool. We'll talk more about fork join pool in a minute and why it's a good default choice. And it has daemon threads, so they'll just exit. Aha, but a fork join pool, if you actually want it to finish its work, totally different. You can call shutdown, but it won't do anything. Because a fork join pool never stops accepting requests for work. That's because it's, in, it's fully intended to have a bunch of tasks inside it that spawn new tasks and submit back into the same pool. And those would fail if, if shutdown actually caused those <coughs> submissions to be rejected. So it never stops accepting requests. All you can do is wait until it's not doing anything and then quick exit before something else like someone externally submits one. So a wait quiescence and, of course, a timeout, because we never, ever block forever. Scala has something very similar. It also has, um, so execution context is just a wrapper for executor. That's, that's all. Scala likes to wrap it and give it its own name, whatever. Um, the global one is a fork join pool. Therefore, it has daemon threads. And this is actually really extra clever. I'll get to why in a minute. But it's a very carefully designed default pool. Still, um, if you use it, you're, you're sharing it with I don't know who. Anything else that's compiled into your program could also be using it. One nice thing about Scala futures, you give it the stuff to do, and then it wants it requires an execution context, but you can make it available implicitly, which means you can put it at the top of your file. Every future in this file, just use, usually we're lazy, and do the global context. Um, but you can also specify an explicit one at any given call. I like that. Scala futures do something else right. With Whenever you add an instruction set, extend what the future is going to do, then you give it that code, and the, this blue code here, I totally wish my IDE would do this for me. If it would just like change the background or the color or something, if it knows that this code is going to run in a different thread, then I would stop screwing up my actor state by 
putting something that mutates state or uses um, sender in um, a future because this is totally going to run on a different thread and it's going to run on a thread in the execution context passed in. Now that could be set at the top of the file, but somewhere it's my execution context. What I like about this is in Scala futures, you can't piggyback on whatever thread pool the original future is running in. In Java, you can. You, you have the option with completable future, you can do it either way. You can supply a new executor or you can piggyback on whatever thread the future is running in. And I'll get to why that can be dangerous in a minute. But Scala futures, thumbs up. And then there's closure. Oh my gosh, why did I even bother? This just, just wraps a Java future. That's all. So, so, and you don't even get to choose your thread pool either, like you do with a Java future. Uh, you always get the agent send off executor. That's the same thread pool that's used for agents. It's got the one minute timeout. And it will start infinite threads. If for every job you give it, if there's not a thread sitting there, it's going to start a new one. That's a cache thread pool. Uh, right, and then the one minute timeout. But right, these futures, I'm sorry. They're Java futures and Java 5 futures, and they're not monadic. So if we want monads, we know where to go. <laughs> Scala Z also has a future. Never use it. <laughs> Instead, you use a task, which is basically, and, and it says that. It says never use this. It, that's intended to not be used. You're supposed to use a task, which adds error handling. So they've separated those concerns. And a future without exception capturing is ridiculous. So in Scala said you use a task. Task has the unique property of doing trampolining, which means that you can flat map, flat map, flat map, flat map, flat map, map to your heart's content. And all of those will be mapped as objects on the heap instead of rows in the stack, which means you don't blow your stack, which the stack is a limited resource in each thread, unlike the heap, which can grow to gigs and gigs. All right, so the tack, task trades uh, stack for heap, which is great for Scala Z style programming. But it, it wants an executor service, just a straight Java executor service, which is fine. But it, in addition to being implicit, it's also defaulted. So if I forget to supply one, either here or at the top of the file, it doesn't tell me. It just uses this default one. And the default one is a fixed thread pool, but it has daemon threads, so you don't have to worry about shutting them down. But it, it's fixed to the number of available processors in the default. And that's why I'm here. Okay, This is why I'm giving this talk, because in January, uh, I was using Scala's head, and it was doing these things, and I had this test that ran fine locally, ran fine for everybody else, failed on the continuous integration server. No, worse, it didn't fail. It just hung until Scala test killed it in desperation. Right, which turned out to be because I have eight CPUs, uh, uh, Team City was running on a single CPU machine, and just one, it's just not enough, not, not nearly enough. So this is kind of like, that you could to understand this problem, uh, which was a thread in this pool blocking on a request to this pool. Uh, think of like there's one car service in town and it's like super cheap so everybody uses it. And that works totally fine in the big city. But then you go to like a po uh, podunk little town where you've only got one car, one driver for the car service and uh, you order a pizza and the pizza company just uses this car service for delivery. So, okay, your pizza's on its way. And then the driver, his vision starts blurring and he thinks he's having a heart attack. So he pulls over and he calls the hospital and asks for an ambulance. But the hospital uses this car service. <laughs> <laughs> so the operator is like, oh, oh, I'll send our driver as soon as he gets back. <laughs> and, and you never get your pizza, never. <laughs> And that's not the worst that happened because your program just hung forever. All right, so that's called pool-induced deadlock. And that's why uh, fixing to a limited number of threads can be really painful. On the other hand, infinite threads is also painful. In addition to using a lot of resources, if, if all of the threads in your system are trying to get a coffee from Starbucks at the same time, then Starbucks drive through gets really backed up and people can't turn left and pretty soon all of Brentwood Boulevard is blocked and they have to start putting in this little traffic things if you can't turn left there. <laughs> so there's also problems with too many threads. 
That's why this is a challenge. Now, uh, Doug Lee says, the good part is the space between too few and too many is usually really wide, but you still do have to think about this. The best we can hope is that you think about it like once when you're first introducing concurrency into whatever module you're working on. And then if you get it right there, you'll probably not have any problems. And the other thing is when you do have problems, yeah, we'll get to the stack trace in a minute. OK, your choices of thread pools when you're deciding what to do. Single thread executor is the simplest. You've got an unbounded queue. The queue is represented by the little house attached to the, cell re the request receiver tower there. And you've got just one car. This is great for things like the swing event dispatch thread. If your purpose is just staying alive and responding to the user and you shunt off anything that's going to take a while to other threads, awesome. And you can also own your own mutable state if this thread is the only one that accesses that state, like in the UI. It's good for that. Just don't block. Just, just don't do it. You've ruined it if you're blocking on your single thread executor. The opposite of this is the cached thread pool, which has infinite threads. So it's got the gravel parking lot here, because if, if that fills up, they'll just start parking in the grass, no bother. And the thing is, this one has a synchronous blocking queue, which is not much of a queue. It's just every time you um, execute something on this thread pool, if there's not a thread waiting, it's going to start one up that goes directly to a thread. There's nobody in a house keeping a list. The good part is you can totally block. That doesn't bother anybody. You can start as many flow of executions as you need to wait around. But unlimited threads has cost. You've got the drive through backup, and you've got memory that you can run out of and stuff like that. And you can flood the downstream system. That, well, that's the Starbucks drive through backup. So you might think a fixed thread pool could be useful, and it can be. If you want to throttle, you can totally throttle with a fixed thread pool. If you only have 10 threads that are allowed to call that service, then you'll never have more than 10 service calls open at once, and you won't flood it. Just make sure you don't do any recursive blocking. Don't block on something that's going back to your thread pool, which doesn't sound like it would be that hard, except you don't always know what thread you're running on. Are you on your own thread pool when you call this? And you have to watch out for other people's code. Uh, because if you accept a callback and then run it on your thread pool, well, this is what I was doing with the Scala Z stuff, as I was passing in a callback that called back into the same library, and her, but only on the CI server, which was weak. Right, so, and, and that sucks, right? Why should my code behave differently on a different computer? But it totally does when you base your fixed thread pool on the number of available processors, which apparently everybody does because they think they're max trying to maximize CPU. This is not trying to maximize CPU. In, in the Starbucks case, uh, absolutely nothing to do with N, and then you're a little better off because if it's just always 10, then, or whatever is in your config file, then it can behave um, the same on different computers, big plus. You can also go in between. If you use the thread pool executor constructor, you get a ridiculous number of configurations. Both the fixed thread pool and the cache thread pool are simply using this constructor with different parameters. You can set the core pool size. Those are the ones that'll stay alive forever. Um, the max pool size is the gravel parking lot. But that, the, it only starts populating the gravel parking lot after the queue is full. And then the keep alive time, by default, applies only to the, the gravel parking lot, not the core threads, although you can change that. And then the queue itself is really interesting. So you, you pass in a blocking queue, and you could use an unbounded one or a bounded one with limited length, um, which is the only way you'll ever get to the gravel parking lot, or the synchronous queue, which like the cache thread pool uses so that it's never queuing stuff. It's always running it. Or you could do something like a priority blocking queue um, and like have it rearrange your tasks as they come in. That'd be kind of cool. Lots of options there. Uh, thread factory, we talked about the daemon on the thread. You can also set its name, which we'll see in a minute, and some other stuff that I have no idea what that's good for. And finally, you can set the rejected execution handler. So this is what happens if all the threads are busy, the queue is full, it's not allowed to create any more threads, it doesn't have like max in for the max number of threads like a cache thread pool does, and everything's full, you can have it do different things. The default is to throw a rejected execution exception, which is also what happens after shutdown. Uh, but you could have the calling thread run it. Well, that's clever. I'm busy. Do it yourself. I wish my kids would do that when they ask me for food at breakfast. 
Uh, you can have it just discard it silently, which I don't know why you would ever want to do that. But discard oldest is interesting. If the purpose of your thread pool is like to go retrieve data to populate a detail as they click on different rows in a table, you could have it just discard the oldest one and then you're not dealing with clicks from five minutes ago that they don't care about. You're only working on the most recent click. That, that's kind of useful. Okay, so that's like a zillion million options. You can do a lot with Thread Pool Executor when you get down there. And now you kind of know what's available and hopefully you never have to go read the API docs for that. They're well written, but they're still Java API docs. Finally, we have the why can't we just have one that does things right? The fork join pool is an executor service, but it's not a thread pool executor. It's its own thing. And it's specifically made for very small tasks that spawn more small tasks. And its goal is to maximize processor power. Um, now, I don't really care about maximized processing power, but this, this is used as the common pool for some other reasons because it's really smart. A little bit more overhead than the other thread pools, so if you're really looking for performance, and your tasks are big, this isn't what you want. But um, the awesome thing is that it's really good at keeping enough threads open to keep the CPUs busy. And then if you need to block, you can, but you can tell it. In Java, you have to use a managed blocker, but Scala has this beautiful thing, and it's got like infrastructure built into the global pool to handle this that, oh man, well, this says scala.concurrent.blocking, obviously. And you give the blocking, and this says service.colonate. Um, so just whatever you have that's going to access the network or the database or whatever, you put it in a blocking block, and that tells Scala's fork join pool that this thread is going to hold still for a while, and it compensates by starting up another thread. So the fork join pool doesn't have a fixed number of threads. It has a desired parallelism, which defaults to your number of CPUs. But whenever it knows a thread is blocking, it just compensates with another one. It'll also always use the calling thread as well, even your main thread. When you like use a parallel stream, your main thread's going to get subsumed into that fork join pool because, well, otherwise, what would it be doing? We're going to keep it busy. Yeah, Doug Lee's fork join pool works really, really hard to keep those threads busy all the time. So that's really cool. That's what makes the fork join pool an amazing default. OK, we've got all of those. Quickly go around the circle, and, and what do these guys use? Akka uses a fork join pool. But of course, that's configurable. Frickin' everything is configurable in Akka. You can even tell it to use daemon threads if you want to. Lots of stuff. Um, agents, we've got a fixed thread pool with a number of processors plus two, so at least it never gets down to one, and a cache thread pool for the stuff that blocks. Channels, uh, yeah, so you can see how scientific <laughs> the uh, fixed thread pool number is. Number of processors times two plus 42. <laughs> ah, that ought to be enough. <laughs> Parallel streams uses a fork join pool. It was made for that. And futures, of course, you're choosing your own. Now. OK, great. So we've got these pools. Now it's time to talk about failure. What happens? What do you do when this stuff isn't working? You use the global thread pool, or you made up some thread pool, you pulled 42 out of your butt, and now you need to know why is your program hanging. JStack is a program that you run at the command line. You give it the PID of the process that you're interested in, and it does a thread dump. And you get the stack trace of all the different threads. Like in this example, here's one from pool one, whatever that is, that's awaiting. And then it gives me the line in the code so I can go and find out that it's actually waiting on this guy in the fork join pool. That's Scala's common pool in this case uh, that's sleeping because I wanted to get this stack dump. And then there's another one that's doing nothing. It's just scanning the queue. And there's another one. The main thread is waiting on a promise with the timeout, of course. Right, so one thing that I want you to get out of this is it would be really nice if the common pool named itself common pool. Maybe that's the only bad thing I can say about the Scala common pool. Um, so it's polite to give your th threads a name that is descriptive. How do you do that? Well, you set it, of course, after you get it and return it from the new thread method inside the thread factory that you pass into the constructor. And that counter, so that you can count the threads and get unique names, yeah, global variable. Make your, so, make your own, bummer. I guess you could use a GUID, but 
numbers are shorter and, and then sometimes have meaning, sometimes. While you're in here, you might consider setting the uncaught <coughs> exception handler. If you don't set this, then if the thing that was passed into execute throws an exception that bubbles all the way up, uh, the default behavior is to write to standard error, that stack trace, which frankly is a really good default behavior, and that's what I want to happen. Unfortunately, a lot of these concurrency abstractions prevent that from happening, especially futures. Futures capture exceptions. Errors are data, right? So great, we want to capture the data and give it to people. But that keeps it, if you don't wait on the future, if you don't block on it, and why would we want to block, you never see the data. Therefore, I recommend doing things like, um, if your futures accept instructions, and if they don't, why are you using them? Um, put something in the on failure to print the stack trace. You know, that's pretty simple. And then you can go ahead and return the future, and other people can also react to the exception. They can attach more instructions, um, and then they can do whatever they want with it. And if they do block on it, great, that's fine too. But here, at least I know it's going to print something, the standard error, and I'm going to see it. Uh, if, and when, when this happens, when, no, this prevents the thread from dying. Um, in general, if you don't catch the exception, the thread just dies and goes away, and then you don't see it in that stack dump, which can be really confusing. This keeps the thread alive. Um, on the other hand, if you get an out of memory exception, that won't be captured by Scala's futures, but why would you want to capture that? You're just horked. Your whole actor system is going down, give it up when you get out of memory. The other ones, uh, parallel streams will just, you know, you'll throw the exception on the map of the reduce. In Java, you get randomly one of the exceptions. In Scala, you get all of the ones that it collected before it gave up. Uh, channels, eh. If your, your go loop throws an exception, it, your channel just closes, it's dead, it's gone. You're out of luck. You have to, if you want to handle failure, you have to wrap your code, catch it, put the exception on the channel, notice that on the other side and throw it again or something. So, bummer. Agents, on the other hand, have failure handling built in. The agent will hold on to the exception and put itself in an error state that you can check. You can also add error handlers to them. So that's pretty cool. It's almost as good as Akka. Well, okay, it's, it's on the same spectrum. And Akka is totally built around failure. So there's a whole hierarchy and a whole set of routines. And Akka, failure is expected. And I like that because that's, that's real life. All right, but there's one thing that's worse than failure, and that is not failing. And Oh, dear, what did I push? <laughs> OK, that was weird. All right. <laughs> this car that crashed, at least it's off in a ditch, and hopefully it printed something to standard error. At least it's not blocking traffic. <laughs> <laughs> this car, on the other hand, is sitting there with everybody lined up behind it. And if it just sits there forever, then I will never know where the problem was. I mean, I can do that that JSTAC dump on my production process, but I'm gonna see all of these, and I'm gonna to have to dig through all of them and look at all of their code to try to find out which one is waiting on something that isn't each other. It's really a pain in the butt. So, always block with a timeout. Never, ever block forever. Okay, in conclusion, how to concurrency. First, don't do it. I mean, really? If you can get away with having the road system all to yourself, why wouldn't you? Your program is so much easier to think about if you just keep it in a single thread. You can even be asynchronous with, um, with multiple flows of execution virtually in, in a single thread, like Node, and suddenly it's easy enough. It, <laughs> it's a good idea, you know? I, I do wish that I could drive around and be the only car on the road. It's not practical in real life, but sometimes it is in our happy little programming worlds. And of course, don't do it yourself. So if your objective is to maybe make a thread pool that calls a service and it's a fixed thread pool so that it throttles and then you're gonna like try to, failure is just gonna happen. It's not a matter of whether we fail anymore, it's about how we fail and can we degrade gracefully. So if your service that you're calling is down or more painfully really slow so that you can't tell whether it's ever going to respond or not, consider Netflix's Hysterix library. 
it's totally, Netflix is like microservices happy. And so they've actually put the thought into um, when you have a whole bunch of little pieces connected together, how do you make sure those connections are right or at least working and handle it when they don't work? And if nothing else, if you go look at Hystrix, you will be like, oh my God, this is so complicated. I have to think about so many things. I have to think about timeouts and retries and caching and pool sizes and blah, blah, blah. And you'll be like, how can it be this hard? And that's the whole thing. It is this hard. When we start adding cars to the road and adding Starbucks and McDonald's, and it's not a real Starbucks, it's a Starbucks that's in Keokuk, and we're trying to get coffee from there, it's not easy. And it's really not easy to degrade painfully, uh, gracefully. It is easy to be painful about. OK. <laughs> so don't do it yourself. And also, when you are doing this, um, consider all these frameworks that are out there because they've worked really hard to make it easier to do things right. And finally, when you do have to come up with your own thread pool, ask yourself, first, whose threads am I using? Because if you're the main, if you're like the main function or the top level of your program, you're probably OK using the global thread pool. But if you're a module or a library that gets compiled in, you don't know who else is sharing that thread pool and who you're going to stomp on when you forget to put that blocking block in. Um, so yeah, keep in mind whose threads you're using. And often you'll want to just create your own so you don't mess with anybody else. Consider how you know well when your program is done and a reasonable number of threads to use. And Think about what's going to happen when it fails. Specifically, how are you going to know it failed? Whether you is your library itself and the code in it, or you the programmer when you're reading the logs. And never, ever block forever. I don't care if you really want to just, just run that task and not give it a timeout. At least give it four hours. Something, because failure is better than suspense. I'm Jessatron. I will put the link to this Prezi up on my blog. Um, thank you. <laughs>